evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. New York is a democratic town, and we would never elect anyone mayor who is not a Democrat, except for the last five <laughs> times. And now, as an era dominated by independent-minded uh, Michael Bloomberg is ending, it appears, if you believe the pundits, that we are poised for a restoration of what once seemed to be the natural order of things. Bill de Blasio, who was as dyed-in-the-wool Democrat as you can get, won more than 40 percent in the September 10th primary, setting up a match with uh, Republican Joe Loda, a one-time Giuliani lieutenant who was a classic city Republican, socially liberal and fiscally conservative. Unlike Rudy Giuliani's election over David Dinkins in 1993, coming in the wake of the Crown Heights riots, and Bloomberg's 2001 defeat of Mark Green as the World Trade Center site continued to smolder, Democrats are unified, and there does not seem to be, at least not yet, an, an existential crisis that threatens that unity. De Blasio's victory also provided a powerful window on the economic inequality that besets this city, as Bloomberg, if you agree with uh, de Blasio's critique, catered far more to the upper classes than to those in the lower economic rungs. Joe Loda charges de Blasio as running a class warfare campaign, complete with an odd detour into the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua in the 1980s, singling out a de Blasio proposal to raise taxes on those with incomes over, over $500,000 to fund preschool and after-school programs. De Blasio supporters countered with the old saying that they only call it class warfare when the poor fight back. De Blasio's victory also signaled a rejection of sorts of the identity politics that, that for so long has driven political analysis. He defeated Council Speaker Christine Quinn among women voters and among gay voters, and either tied or slightly outpolled Bill Thompson among African American voters. And the prominent involvement of his interracial family, both on the stump and in one memorable commercial featuring his son Dante's remarkable throwback afro, signaled that this is a new New York. One thing is certain, Dante de Blasio has earned a big raise in his allowance. <laughs> we are joined by four New Yorkers who closely watched the political debate and the political shenanigans that marked this year's mayoral race. Ken, Ken Sherrill is a political science professor emeritus from Hunter College. Morgan Payne is the editor of City and State, the influential online and hard copy publication. Robert George is on the editorial board of the New York Post. And Carolina Gonzalez is the senior producer for, for Futuro Media Group's public radio show, Latino USA. Um, Carolina, let me start. I made the point about identity politics. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, we have our first black president. We've had a black mayor. We've had, we have our first two women. We had our first two women senators. Um, you know, when you look at de Blasio's vote, it kind of upset a lot of the conventional wisdom, which is often conventional but not always wise. Yeah, I mean, I think that... Um you know the thing that you got to distinguish when you're when you're talking about political campaigns and that most pe the average person doesn't really distinguish is what exactly are the political machines there for the political machines there are to line up money and to line up soldiers to get out the vote to like you know raise uh, voters and to do the to do the precinct work um, when you're talking about the voters they're kind of looking at other things they're in part looking about at the media and obviously as somebody who is trying to shape that those perspectives, I'm going to say that we do to some extent do that. Um, but I think that what we're starting to see in New York is really that the, that difference between what kinds of things uh, the voters are looking at and the voters are interested in and, and what's motivating them is a different set of concerns from uh, a lot of the political machines in New York, which are frankly really all of them behind the times as far as I'm concerned. Ken, um to what degree was this a referendum on Bloomberg? I mean, the exit polls said uh, people liked the job Bloomberg did, and they kind of wanted to say goodbye to him. They wanted to say good job and goodbye. Right. And Christine Quinn clearly was the candidate most identified with the mayor. Right. Uh, I think the answer is that people generally liked the substance of Bloomberg's mayoralty, but they didn't like the style. They did not like feeling ignored was spoken down to. Mm -hmm. They did not like the attention and respect that was given to the people who the mayor viewed as the economic future of the city, while at the same time, uh, people who were not uh, in the financial industry or in the tech sector uh, were viewed as the great unthinking unwashed 
uh, who should be told not to drink their sodas, uh, not to ask for more, and to be happy to live in such an enlightened society. Yeah. And they didn't like it. You know, uh, de Blasio's critique of economic inequality, which kind of feeds into the point he's making about Bloomberg, um, almost kind of a trickle-down theory of economics, doesn't change the fact that whoever the next mayor is is walking into like what seven and a half billion dollars of 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 unfunded union contracts of some real you know uh, the next yeah. mayor is probably going to have to say no mm -hmm. well th that's i mean that's kind of the interesting issue and that's kind of um w w what it's going to be very fascinating to see if if joe loda if he kind of gets moves on from his sandinista fa um, um, fascination um if he does focus on that because um de, de blasio has, has already said that he wants to raise taxes to, uh, to focus on funding pre-k and things like that but the, the, he, he does have to deal with this issue of, of, of labor, and labor has been chomping at the bit uh, to, get, to get this retroactive pay. It is close to $8 billion. He says that he, it's going to be impossible to actually um, um, pay for all of that, but he wants to do something, do something for them. But even if you say you know, half, of, half of that, you, you've got to figure out where, the, where that money is coming from, and the only way, play, way he would be able to fund it is if he ended up having to raise other, t other taxes, either um, income taxes or, or raise property taxes, and I, I, I think even in very liberal New York, that's going to be a non-starter. Um, Morgan, you're the editor. You run city and state. The, the, the publication. <laughs> well, it's only, I some people both the city, city and the some, state. Some people think city and state runs the city and state. Um, Democrats have a long history of doing firing squads in a circle, although Republicans, kind of what the Republicans nationally are doing right now. Can they blow this election? I mean, I, it's never impossible. Uh, the Republicans are fond of saying that they've had uh, essentially a Republican or independent mayor for the last 20 years. But it's important to remember that both Dinkins and Bloomberg were uh, elected under extraordinary circumstances. Giuliani. Right. I'm, I'm sorry, Giuliani and uh, Bloomberg were elected under extraordinary circumstances. I think that were it not for 9-11, as you pointed out in your introduction, I mean, that really tipped the scales once Giuliani became America's mayor uh, and endorsed Bloomberg. I mean, Bloomberg was trailing heavily in the polls until the 11th hour. Uh, similarly, you know, if it, we had not had all the problems of the Dinkins administration with crime and with, you know, the race riots, I mean, that set a different, uh, you know, created a different environment by which a Republican could get in. But we've seen that not only uh, do we still have a six to one uh, Democratic versus Republican advantage, but we are moving, I th believe, since uh, Giuliani was elected, it's about two to three percent more Democratic, and the Democratic voters are no longer Reagan Democrats, uh, you know, to any degree, but we see increasingly more progressive Democrats, and so but, it's a very there, difficult and, and, needle to thread. And, and while it is true, as we were talking about before, that um, pure identity politics uh, has, in a sense, kind of subsided to a certain extent, the fact is, though, that the, the demographics of the city are a lot, are a lot different. Um, you used to have um, a, a greater percentage of, uh, well, the Reagan Democrats specifically being um, uh, Italian uh, Italian, Irish, and so forth, and now you, you're getting more Latinos, more African Americans, and so forth. And right now, they well, nobody they, they default majority. they default to the Democrats. Nobody right. is a majority right now. Right. So uh, you know, which is go ahead. Well, I mean, I mean, one is the population change over the past 20 years is huge. Uh, not just people dying and being born, but people moving out of the city and moving in it's tran transformed the political makeup of the city. Uh, but the other thing is that I think people are misunderstanding identity politics. Mm -hmm. it, identity is not just someone who shares my characteristic. It's someone who shares my values and views. And what happened in this election is at least on the surface, issues trumped identity. But if you think about identity seriously, every one of the identity groups you're talking about are groups with very progressive value structures, and they move to the candidate who was closest to them on the issues. That's Al. That's Al. That's Al Sharpton's argument. Is that right. it's, it's the identity of issues? The identity politics of policy, I think, is the way. For, and and I, it's one of those rare occasions where I think I will I will agree um, yeah. um, with the um, yeah with the. You with, repeat with the, that just I want to make one sure of those I rare occasions where I will <laughs> indeed agree with uh, uh, agree with the uh, agree with the Reverend. And 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 I have to and also too this also showed that um, the campaigns campaigns do matter. 
Um, you know, Bill, Bill de Blasio did two things that I will, as an observer, you, you, you kind of um, credited him with. Um, first, we, you, you mentioned the commercial with his, um, with his son, son Dante, which um, allowed him to play identity politics without playing identity mm -hmm. politics, using mm -hmm. his son, as a, in a sense, uh, to speak not just to African Americans, but young people and so, and, and so, and so forth. That, um, you know, that was great. And he also, um, in addition to stop and frisk, which all of them sort of kind of touched upon, he also zeroed in on the hospital closings issue issue which was not really an which was not really an issue until he kind of kind of zeroed in on it and elevated it got himself arrested over it and so forth and that gave him one more issue to sort of uh, differentiate him, himself from the other candidates. And you know and the yeah. other thing that I think you have to look at is if you look at um, one of the consequences of the demographics of New York changing is that you have a lot more politicians that are being elected from different communities and they're all turning out to be as equally rotten as the old guard <laughs> so the idea that you're going to vote that voting for a the politician scandal. yeah so it's like if you're gonna if you you no longer are going to vote for a politician because they share you know some kind of heritage or neighborhood from you because they may just turn out you know i mean like look at all the people who got taken out i mean look let's Let's not go. Let's not go to the Vita Lopez uh, discussion. But, well, mean, but but no. But you, 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 what you said is right. I mean, we we've had you know we've had um, you know white Republicans from Queens, black um, black Democrats from from Queens, um, you know black um, black Democrats from the Bronx. I mean, it's really been a, a mixture Kruger of from uh, Canarsie. Kruger from yeah, yeah, Kruger yeah. from, from Canarsie. Let's have so, an equal opportunity in corruption. Well, well yeah, equal yeah. equal it opportunity is. corruption, equal which means which means people <laughs> tend to say you know. Um, you know, this person may look like me, and he may share my values, but he could just be as much of a crook as the guy over there, yeah, but who does not necessarily but, do. But you also see very, you know, very low turnout. How much of that is a plague on all your houses? I was, I was going to say that, you know, I, I'm not sure to what degree the electorate is even representative of the larger population. When you have 21 percent of registered voters coming out and determining an election, right? I mean, we did a series with City Limits and PBS's Metro Focus called the Five Borough Ballot, where over the last 11 months, we've gone to the same location. Uh, one in each of the five boroughs to so just ask regular New Yorkers what they thought of the election. And we found that it was consistently not representative of the larger media narrative or even how people voted on Election Day. And we had one case, uh, a gentleman on the Upper West Side who was the manager of uh, the restaurant that we were focusing on. And he had went, initially he was a Thompson supporter, then he was a de Blasio supporter, and he felt so passionately about the election. And then he had the day off on primary day and he didn't vote. Uh, and that was, I felt like, really uh, embodied for me uh, what we're up against in the city, that even people who find themselves to be politically engaged to a degree are not showing up at the polls. And so how representative is the result of the larger animus of the city? It's, it's unclear. Well, and that's very, and that's very dis it's, it's very disappointing to hear that because at, at least in this in, the, in, in this race uh, on the Democratic side you had you know three very strong um, you know fairly well known well organized um, camp um, campaigns with with Quinn Thompson and, and De Blasio and if you know if they can't somehow you know en well and energize, if Weiner didn't implode the second time you would have had a fourth very mm -hmm. very strong you, you, well yeah exactly but uh, you know, if, if even that can't draw people out you know it, it, it's 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 uh, it's depressing I think for the for the broader civic discussion and uh, first of all I, I think you know we have to see whether or not turnout in November is as light as it was in September to to say seriously that people are really turned off on the political process it may well be that in November uh, if the election is a runaway that people won't think it's worth their time to go out and vote uh, but that same thing the fact that the primaries seem to be so close should have motivated people to go out and vote on primary day. It's possible that the screw-ups at polling places in recent years have had an effect depressing, depressing turnout. Uh, it's I such don't know. an, un I it's such an you, unpleasant experience. I, mean, I know, but I got to tell you, it's like last, you know, last year's election, which was a presidential election, I it took me almost an hour to vote. Right. This year, it's like there were three people ahead of me, you know. So it's, I, I can't blame that on the machines. No, I didn't even blame it on the machines. You know. I blamed it on cumulative bad experiences. Well, yeah, and and the fact is, there is there is a history, particularly uh, in terms of municipal elections. You know, in terms of the board of elections, um, shall we say, not exactly performing up to you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, even e even mediocre. Mm -hmm. Well, I will admit that I am a luddite and don't trust machines, but but you had your old machines. I find back. it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, and I love the 
the physical quality of pulling that machine, you know, as we all grew Blank. up, as we all grew up voting on. Yeah. But I, I, some some young people in this audience who are much more techno savvy than me can explain why the optical scanner machines, which are mini computers, don't produce quicker results. I, I just don't. Well, I just don't well we see this is this is the this is the frustration that I think a, um, a lot of. Uh, I mean, our paper, uh, the, the, the Post has written about this, the Daily News has written about this too. Is, is the the frustration that p people have with the with the Board of Elections, the, mm -hmm. I, the the idea that you know we have upgraded technology, but they say because of the upgraded technology, they don't have enough time to count the votes um, between primary day and p the potential runoff mm -hmm. day. And I'm so in a you know in an era when we've got you know we've got we've got Google, we've got Apple, we've got all of these kind of things. The idea that technology is come, somehow retarding the process in New York City of all places, I think, is, is kind of outrageous and should be and should be offensive to, to everybody. I, 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 mean, I agree but, with you, right. but you know, I, I don't think that. It, I, mean, I, I think it's pretty inside baseball, uh, you know, or disillusionment with the Board of Elections. I don't think that is a calculus for most people when they go to vote. I do think that uh, we have very, we've done everything we can to suppress voter turnout. We don't have same-day registration. We don't have early voting. We don't have all these mechanisms by which you can boost voter turnout and it's very deliberate because the political parties and the bosses know that statistically the, the fewer people who come out to vote the higher re-election rate for the incumbent and so this is a way of, of preserving the powers that be and there are so many ways I mean we could allow 16 year olds and 17 year olds to pre-register to vote uh, there are so many methods that we could boost voter turnout and we are deliberately not exploring those avenues very interesting um, I do want to mention that there are, of course, other candidates. I mean, Adolfo Carrion is running on the... Who? Um, Adolfo. I worked for Adolfo Carrion at one point when he was first elected borough president, and he'll punch me in the nose if I don't at least mention him. <laughs> and Jimmy McMillan got on the ballot today. The rent is, the rent is too damn high. So... Um, Hittery. Huh? And Hittery. Jack Hittery. And Jack, 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 and Jack Hittery, Hittery is, uh, is on the ballot, who Hittery. is a uh, very interesting kind of tech... Um, you know, tech entrepreneur, and we do have a runoff election. We have a runoff election for public advocate that where we're going to be spending $20 million for a job that has an annual budget of $2.3 million. Dollars. Yeah. Actually, I think they've, they've, they've lowered the cost of it. I think they now think that it's down to, it's down to only spending $13 million on it. Uh -huh. So, um, And the public <laughs> advocate's budget has been reduced serially by several mayors. By several mayors. So uh, um, yeah, it's not really a fair comparison. Well, I mean, it is it is fair because it, it's a it's a I mean, it's basically it's basically a useless office. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only constitutional responsibility it has is if the mayor becomes incapacitated or, or, or leaves, um, that person becomes acting mayor for about 60 days. For, for 60 mm -hmm. for 60 days. Um, otherwise, that person is sort of a uh, is sort of an institutionalized gadfly. Which gives it gives that person the uh, ability to um, pick apart things that the mayor is doing or is not doing, or the city council but, is or is but, not doing, without yeah. having any responsibility for the process, um, him or her, herself. I mean, or, but, or, or, and it gives and it gives that person then a yet, jump, a a jump a, to get become to be mayor in waiting next time around. But since we were talking about identity politics, we are going to have a white male comptroller, a white male mayor. Um, you have an African American woman in Tish James and a, and, and a white, a white senator in Daniel Squadron running for that office, and identity politics figures into it. How in in this city where we as we talked about everybody's a minority in this city, you know a the, and the idea a, of having three white men just in terms of optics. And there's a spillover. Is that, there's a spillover. Is that a there's a spillover effect to what happens in that race with what happens with, with with the speaker as well. Right. right. Uh, the selection, and which is another thing, which is a political point, I, you know, I'd love to hear your guys' opinion on, is we are going to be picking a new, you know, the a new city council is going to be much more to the left than the old city council, and probably on balance more to the left than Bill de Blasio is. You know, de Blasio to some degree is going to be outflanked yeah. on the left by the city council, and... Does he get involved? And Bill is a master operative for any of us who know him over any period of time. Um, in fact, one of the questions is, can he move from operative to being a leader? Mm. And will he get involved in the selection of a speaker? A, it would be good if he could have some influence on it because that would help him get his, his, you know, whatever he needs to get through the city council. But B, if he's not successful, because that's a vote that requires just 26 votes from some pretty savvy political people who understand their own interests better than probably he does, 
if he does if he is not successful does he begin his administration behind the eight ball well first of all it's going to be the first time if he wins that there will be a mayor and a city council majority of the same party since under the new charter right right, right. Okay. Uh, and so the, the whole game of choosing a, a speaker is going to be different. It's not going to be just the county leaders making a deal. Well, you have the it's, Progressive Caucus, which right. is kind of almost, I mean, in, in Queens, um, a good number of the newly elected council members were not backed by the county organization. Right. Mm -hmm. But you also have a mayor at the peak of his power. He's just been elected, honeymoon period, and there are a lot of appointments yet to be made. Uh, and this I hope be, he hasn't made any appointments yet. I hope he's focusing on the election. <laughs> right. No, no, I mean, I mean when, when the right. city council is electing a speaker. Mm. And I, I think members of the city council are not going to be anxious to cross a new mayor if and, he's of the same party. And it, isn't, right. it is rather interesting, too, that um, one of the uh, um, presumed leading candidates uh, for speaker um, Inez Dickens, uh, who's had um, kind of mm -hmm. a number of issues with um, uh, um, the houses that she owns and things like that. Um, um, Bill de Blasio um, endorsed her opponent in the, um, uh, in the primary, uh, right, uh, right. Vince, Vin Vince Morgan. Well, another so, one. So to the extent right. that that shows any indication who he would not necessarily like to see in the speakership, you, um, you know, other people may be trying to bend his ear. Well, you also have Jamani Williams, who's one of the, who I think is one of the most talented people in the council, and there are questions uh, raised about his commitment on the issue of abortion, his commitment on the issue of gay marriage. And are you going to have another from person Brooklyn. from Brooklyn, right? Well, well, yeah. You know, I mean, you're going to have the entire city run by Brooklynites, and that's going to be very well, that would problematic, be okay. right? But, 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 well, but, it's I'm fine with me. I'm a Brooklynite, but... Uh, but, no, but, but that's <laughs> interesting, though, because uh, he, uh, I mean, I, I, disagree, I disagree with him, but he was one of the persons... Um, 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 most responsible for for getting these, the stop and frisk um, legislation through. So I mean, you know, he, he, he's, he's indicated he's definitely an up and comer. Whether whether his time is now or whether mm -hmm. it may still be another election away. But you're well, running. And there's, with, and there's also Melissa Mark Vivarito. Right. So. There's Melissa. Oh, that's so Melissa. Last time Mark you had Brooklyn running everything, it was Abe Beam and Tom Cute. Uh, things didn't go very well then. And Dan, Dan Gorodnik, um, of course, is well, the, the Gorodnik, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy back up. Every member Jimmy, who isn't a freshman Jimmy has voted their name the on press for being right. a um, you have, I mean, right, there's a whole range of, range of possibilities. But the question is, and, you know, I believe that, uh, I think you're right, that depending on whether James or Squadron wins the public advocate mm -hmm. race could have an impact on the on the degree to which identity politics plays sure. a role if, in the selection. If Dan speak. Squadron wins, Mark Weprin and Dan Gorodnik are out of the running. Are out of the running. Right. There's right. absolutely right. no that's scenario where they're that, going to be selected speaker. Right. Yeah. I tend that's to think Brooklyn is out of the running. Really? I, I agree. Well, if you have a mayor, a, a uh, uh, public advocate, uh, both from Brooklyn, uh, mm. the, cha the chances yeah. are that you're not that's going to get a speaker you know, But Brooklyn. you have... You know, you know, we, you know, the the, the traditional slash conventional public uh, political analysis right. is by borough. Right. But you know, to what degree has the progressive caucus kind of changed that calculus? That there's just you know um, identity of policy, if you will. Mm -hmm. I mean, it had, you know, you know, we don't know, but the, but they tested. had an but right. they had an impact on how the council did things, particularly in the area of stop and frisk, an issue that I think. The mayor never understood, and and the, and the police commissioner never understood the passion mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for that issue. Because just as a, just as a you know, people are not uh, you know, this is my own opinion. People are not opposed to the legitimate use of stop and frisk if there is in fact reasonable, if there is in fact reasonable suspicion. I, I, I well, you know this. It comes down to whether you believe that our city council members are governed by ideology or are they governed by self-interest, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think that they're or trying to... Both or both, and many, many more I, things. But I, I mean, I think both. if you're trying to execute some sort of a progressive agenda, right, you're going to make a different set of decisions than if you're having a council, you know, committee chairmanship dangled in front of you and, you know, Joe Crowley in Queens is telling you this is how you have to vote because Queens has to hang together in order to elect the next speaker, right? And so you're only going for... You're only appealing to 
to a constituency of 51 people, right? This isn't representative of the larger electorate. And so, you know, you're trying to angle for where you're going to play. And you're, there are 20 new freshmen, right, in the council. And all those council members are not going to want to start off their careers as pariahs. And keep in, and keep in mind, too, uh, I mean, you, you were asking about, you know, what influence the, what influence the mayor uh, has. Um, the mayor can make certain de decisions uh, to populate part of his cabinet from some of those, from, from, from some of those other, uh, some of those uh, uh, council uh, council members as well. So that can also exactly. that can also um, throw a spanner. I just think that way. he's, you know, I think any mayor who gets involved in this in the in the selection of a speaker better win. Yeah, because if you don't win. You are starting your mayoralty behind the eight ball. And <coughs> as an example, as an example of that, uh, uh, look what happened to um, th then Governor Elliot Spitzer when he tried to select somebody uh, to become to become state comptroller, and the assembly and the legislature basically rebelled against him. And that was a political wound, which uh, ultimately, he, in a certain way, he, I mean, there were a lot of other problems too. But mm -hmm. but it was something that really um, uh, weakened him. Uh, you know, within you know you know. Two or three weeks after he'd um, he'd uh, become um, governor, it's you know just as generals often you know too often fight the last war instead of you know fighting the war in the situation that presents itself. We've heard a lot of talk about of of De Blasio trying to link um, Loda to Giuliani, uh, and Loda trying to link De Blasio to Dinkins, um, and it's very I think that. I think Mayor Bloomberg's decision not to endorse anybody in this race, where you would have presumed that his instinct, you know, would have been to endorse Christine Quinn if she was the Democratic nominee, but now his instinct would be to support Joe Loda. Does he realize that his endorsement? To be kind is a is a is a double edged sword. Well, maybe, after maybe it's only I, I, one edge. After that, a good one. After that, dis, after yeah. that rather disastrous um, uh, New York New York magazine yeah. that came came out and uh, really blew up in the um, faces of well of the mayor and I think it it also damaged damaged Chris uh, Chris Quinn going to that last mm -hmm. weekend um, as well. I mean, I think that from that from that perspective, I think Joe Loda is kind of happy that um, the mayor is uh, sitting yeah. this one out. Mayor right. Bloomberg absolutely does know that, uh, how negative his endorsement would be, or else he would have endorsed Joe Loda. Right, right after uh, De Blasio won the primary, he essentially proffered his endorsement to uh, Loda, and Loda initially said, "Oh, I'd be happy to have the mayor's endorsement." And then they dialed that all back, and uh, all of a sudden, it was like the mayor wasn't going to get involved. And it's because Loda's people went back, they looked at the polling numbers, and they said, "We well, have absolutely no chance of winning if we're going to have the mayor around our necks." And what an, an what an irony! What an irony it is that um, Giuliani's um, blessing after 9/11 basically gave Bloomberg. Um, the, uh, um, the 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 mayoralty, and now um, you know Bloomberg is kind of kind of toxic in the race, and it basically has to kind of. Stay well, out you of have the, except the, the you have the same thing. You have the same thing with Giuliani. You know, I mean, you know, Loda held on to Giuliani in the Republican primary as he should have, right. and Giuliani wasn't at his primary night party. You know, you know, Loda is running as his own man. Go ahead, you know, say what you're going to say. I want to. Well, bring up I was going to say one of the interesting things about about Bloomberg's nonpartisanship. Is that distaste for him is nonpartisan? That that the that the Republicans That's are right. as badly split over over uh, Bloomberg as the Democrats they're, are. They're tired of the they're tired of the nanny of the na right. of the nannyism, well, exactly. and they're also t they're also. I mean, I, I think you, you mentioned that the idea of uh, of Bloomberg sort of. Kind of, you know, t kind of talking down to people. I think um, that's something that sort of spreads across um, mm -hmm. um, the other, ideological lines. And I think the other thing that you have to think about is that really, um, whether it's Loda <laughs> or De Blasio or, you know, you know, runs too damn high guy, which wh whoever gets or elected. Or carry on. Um, <laughs> Got to okay. stick up for four. Okay, the whatever. Um, <laughs> no matter who gets elected, I mean, how many, how many of them, who among them would really have the capacity to kind of push a lot of, um, you know, the kinds of things that Bloomberg is still would like to leave as a legacy or would like his legacy continued? I mean, when you have um, a mayoralty that has been dependent on Bloomberg filling in. Uh, defunding the public sector with his money so then it evens out because you have the private money subbing in 
for the public money. Well, That's nobody's, no one's going to be able to do that. No but one's going to be able to do that. Really, he, he actually hasn't been defunding the public sector so much as the fact that um, uh, the uh, expanding expanding pension costs have actually been eating in, um, into that. I mean, it was uh, pension costs were about one and a half um, billion dollars in 2001, 2002, and they're in the um, seven or eight billion um, area right now. So, I mean, th that that's that's what's really been eating into the year to year um, the, the the year to year costs on, on in the public sector. Let me uh, ask us to become, we are now the Republican Brain Trust. Um, I can say that without laughing. Oh, Lordy. You work for the New York Post. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Uh, <laughs> um, how does, assuming we get past the Sandinista redo and we don't form Somacistas Veloda, uh, you, you all can look it up on Google. Um, um, how, if you were advising Loda, how do you run this campaign? I mean, because we did somehow manage not to elect a Democrat for the last five times. I covered Joe Loda in the Giuliani administration. Of course, Joe Loda was one of the most, was probably the most refreshing, open-minded thinker in an administration quote, 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 where quote, everybody had to, had to drink the Kool-Aid. Well, well, often we had to hold, we had to hold quotes from Joe Loda to keep him for, his own, for his own good, mm. because it was such a kind of stranglehold administration so this is a this is a very reasonable and frankly a very you know a very good guy mm -hmm. he's, so, a I mean, smart, he's, you, he's a smart how he's a do smart you manager. you know you know how do we run his campaign I, I think the the problem that most candidates particularly first-time candidates have is that they're paralyzed by fear of making bold decisions I think that uh, Joe Loda needs to unleash his personality I think we need to see him in all his uh, you know controversial grandeur I also think that he should pay, play up his libertarianism. I think that he should say, yeah, I'm going to fund programs by legalizing marijuana, he, which he believes in. He's go, I think that he should push up the fact that he can e exploit new revenue streams by legalizing some of the city's voice, vices. I think that he should push for the constitutional amendment uh, legalizing gambling, which will be on the ballot in November, to include uh, gambling in New York City uh, and say it's an utter disservice that we're just going to let all that revenue go to upstate. I think he can make some bold decisions. I mean, that's the only chance that he has of standing out. If he goes by any ch page in the traditional Republican playbook, it's going to sound as tired as his campaign has sounded so far. Uh, I mean, and to, li to, to link that, um, he would also, I think he would challenge um, de Blasio to say, he should each ask him each time, how are you going to pay for that? How are you going to pay for that? Because as I said, um, if, if he's got these promises out there to, um, to, to the unions, that has to be, that has to be paid for. And the tax on the rich isn't going to do it. But if you combine it with what you were saying in terms of extra, extra revenue streams, he sounds like somebody who's thinking more outside the box. Right. Exactly. No, exactly. I, I mean, Loda, Loda has to become interesting. Yeah. Uh, he has to be, be bright. He has to show qualities of leadership. And frankly, he almost, you know, I, I think Morgan is right, he has to seem to be running to the left of de Blasio because the Republican voters have nowhere to go. I, I mean, he's uh, got to be interesting to the independents. Bill, Bill de Blasio, despite uh, what I read in your paper, and despite the fact that he's uh, branded as a Sandinista this week, uh, is actually, uh, in my mind, a very moderate Clintonian Democrat. That's what I wrote in my cover story about him. Uh, uh, and my the previous issue, he was a great friend of real estate. He supported building along the Gowanus Canal. He supported the Atlantic Yards project. The, I taxi, mean, the taxi fleet it, owners? Absolutely. I mean, he. I, I would argue that he came out so strongly for hospitals because of the, the, the backing of 1199. Uh, and so, you know, there is a frame. Well, that's, that's, that, that's union. That's not. That's well, I'm saying there is a frame that you can put uh, de Blasio in to kind of uh, try to undermine this this uh, view of him as uh, the progressive savior, because that is not consistent with who he has been in his career. Well, if you look at well, the people in, in his council district, he was not a progressive darling. The, the uh, activists in his district thought of him as like the main mainstream sellout. Well, the activists in his district in Park Slope think that you know Lenin was that, a, that's was true. A right that's wing, true. Was a right wing sellout. Yeah, but um, I mean, but listen, I, I agree with everybody that he, you know, you you can't be this I sort am, of pale. Anyway. You can't be this sort of pale reminder of past administrations. You really have to say, you know, the city. You have to recognize the city is in a different place, and it's in a different moment from the last time that he was involved in the city administration, and it's in a different moment than it's been in each of the last three mayoral administrations. And you have to look at 
what is the city, what is the city going to need and what's going to be good for the city and what is it that you're going to be bringing that's good for the city that is different from what everybody else has been doing. And I think Bill de Blasio has tapped into the zeitgeist with his tale of two cities message. I mean, that was Freddie Ferrer's message, right? And it was, uh, so and it was John Edwards' yeah. message with, on the campaign that Bill de Blasio worked on, right? But it is a particularly resonant message now because it is a message that appeals a very, it hits home for 90% of New Yorkers, right? This isn't a message to the 40% of New Yorkers living below the poverty level. This is a message that resonates with a middle class New Yorkers with really good paying jobs who are still being priced out of their neighborhoods. And so this is a message that speaks to everyone. It's it's not pandering to any one group. And and that's a very difficult uh, area for Loda to navigate because if, if it's going to be like, no, you are this class warrior, it's no one is going to buy that because yeah. everyone understands it. You go home, you look at your paycheck, you understand the problems in your own family, and you see the tale of and right. and and John Katsimatidis um, uh, ran who would have been the first Greek mayor. <laughs> <laughs> um, John Katsimatidis um, ran to Loda's left by by winning Staten Island in the Republican mm -hmm. primary, um, um, partly over the issue of of uh, MTA fees and right. things like, things like that. And so you know that's that's an area where um, uh, Loda would be vulnerable uh, um, against De Blasio. What a, how much of the Staten Island vote was machine controlled as opposed to uh, representing ideological? Staten Island you know, is incomprehensible. That, that, yeah. It has to do because it's basically fiefdoms. Yeah. Around individual right. people. Right. All of which received substantial contributions. Yeah. And I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, even though he, he ran a lot of hard ads against Loda, I mean, I think, um, you know, Katsimitidis um, uh, won Staten Island the old-fashioned way. He bought it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, uh, you, you made the point that, uh, you know, suggesting, is, is that a nice way of putting it, that uh, de Blasio got involved in the um, hospital issue in order to serve his... Um, supporters in 1199 you know i mean obviously i think you could look at it the other way that 1199 came to him because he had, because he expressed an interest in that issue so i mean i'm always suspicious of two path and analysis that puts everything in terms of you know money however having said that um bill de blasio with the exception of 1199 did not get union support in the primary because those decisions were made when Bill de Blasio was at 6% in the polls mm -hmm. and Bill de Blasio was an afterthought and they all were lining up with Thompson they were they were lining up with everybody but Bill de Blasio mm -hmm. Lou had so Lou had more union Lou had right. yeah. John John Lou had yeah. had much more significant union support that's right so does that liberate de Blasio to I, some degree because the next mayor no matter how progressive he is is going to have to say no or else we're going to have the financial control board walk in and take over, you know, take over the city. I, I think it will. And, and first of all, I, I didn't want does to it, intimate does that. It, does it liberate him in any way? I, Even I, though they're all lining up with him now. I, I do think it did, right? Because, you know, one would have expected the Working Families Party to have supported Bill de Blasio, particularly after John Liu's fall from grace. And uh, all the unions went with essentially Quinn, Eric Thompson, and to a lesser degree, Lou. And uh, I think that Bill de Blasio is not as beholden as one might expect because of that, uh, because really only 1199 went out on a limb for him. That's not to say that he is going to be an anti-union mayor by any means. I don't believe anyone believes that. But I do think that he doesn't owe as much as one might expect from the Democratic nominee. And the other thing I wanted to say about the hospitals is, is I, I wouldn't intimate, I wasn't trying to intimate that he doesn't believe in that uh, in supporting the hospitals but if you look at the issues where he's really been out front he just called out David Yasky right he said I'm gonna fire him first mm -hmm. he's got an ex a substantial amount of money from the taxi industry he said I'm gonna ban uh, car horse-drawn carriages the first week he's got a substantial money from the horse-drawn carriage uh, industry so the positions that he's taken really strong and defined stands on there haven't been many have corresponded with where he's gotten a, a great deal of, of funding they also are co correspond to where Chris Quinn got into trouble. Uh, th those are two That was areas. a happy uh, coincidence. Well, w what's cause and effect there? <laughs> yeah. No, but when you talk horses, about... Horses, yes. Tax, but, tax but the, no, not taxes, but, the, but hospital. Taxes, yeah. Hospital closing. Oh, yeah. 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 But the yeah. horse carriage industry and the independent expenditure that was made against Chris, Quinn right. by a very strange array of people who were dominated by people who were financially motivated to get involved with because they were opposition to the horse industry, which is viewed in parts of the, in large parts of the city political community as kind of a fringy issue. And if de Blasio really kind of makes that one of his first pushes, you know, you know, I wonder if it's, um, 
if it's not if if it's really not a very helpful thing. Yeah. Fringy with a surrey on top. Yeah. Fringy yeah. with a surrey. Look up o Google Oklahoma. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I, I think he has no choice but to ban horse-drawn carriages. One of his first acts. I mean, he yeah. has been very clear that. Assuming that, that the council will go do. along with that. Right. Well, and, and I, I think that, as you said, like the the council isn't going to want to start off uh, in an acrimonious footing with with the new mayor, and and that's something that you know Christine Quinn took a strong stand on it. It's not the largest lobby uh, maintaining that industry, and I think that he has really you know made it very clear that this is one of the actions but, he absolutely must but, take. But. What it does raise the question about is the potential role of independent expenditures in the general election. I mean, you see stirrings already of people who are going to be coming in, mm -hmm. throwing a lot of money in on behalf mainly Coke. of Loda. The right. Koch brothers, yeah. is the, the Koch right. brothers in particular. So those those spectacular that. ads. Mm -hmm. Was those it are really spectacularly good ads that the Koch brothers are running? Uh, I mean, the, yeah. the, but isn't that a, a net deficit? I mean, who in New York City is going to be wooed by the money of the Koch brothers, right? I mean, just to say well, that that's they, where the money is we, coming. We yeah, there we are a lot of low information. Jobs, but we, jobs but we, we, recently found out, we recently found out both uh, John Katsimatidis and uh, Elliot Spitzer both spent um, $10 million on uh, on advertising and so forth. And, you know, they and they and ultimately they, bo they both lost. I mean, I think there's only so far um, that, that, I mean, m money can put you into the race, but it's not necessarily going to push you um, across the finish line. Right, and I think that's one of the interesting stories of this election. I mean, if, if you talk about, you know, people can generally give either time or money to campaigns, and people who can give time generally can't give money, and people who can give money generally can't give time. And uh, those big spending campaigns all lost, and lost to people who well, had... Well, I'm not sure. I mean, they did on the mayoral level. You know, I mean, I've always argued that on a... Well, they that, did on the control level, When too. you're running for mayor... On citywide levels. When you're running for a citywide office, when you're running for mayor, you're running for president, free media, meaning right. news coverage, is going to trump paid advertising. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when you get down into the city council, where you had job, jobs for New York, the real estate board of New York funded all these... Now, they take credit for a number of wins that would have won... If they didn't right. put a dime into the race, right? But it is significant. Let me uh, let me go to questions. I've been remiss. Tell us your name. Speak up and tell us and tell us your campus. Hi. Uh, good evening. My name is Paulina Leva, uh, and I go to City College of New York in Sucktown. Uh, so my question for you is: Do you think uh, if universal pre-K is possible, as we have heard Bill De Blasio propose? Universal pre-K has been promised by the state, by the mayor, by the president. Is it? Is it is it possible or is it a fiscal? Where's is the it money? A fiscal non, Where's non the money? Starter? Yeah. Where's the money? Where's it going to come from? Well, De Blasio yeah. knows knows where he wants it to come from. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I asked the same qu question. You, know, where is it coming from? But uh, given that's one of his, and one of his <coughs> can, that he can, that he, that with he can given his, given it, given it that it's uh, one of his, you know, key platform, um, uh, uh, key platform planks. Um, I think he's going to at least try it. But then the question is, next year, mm -hmm. um, next year he, he he has to go to Albany um, to get them to agree uh, to an income tax hike, and that's going to be, that's an election year for, uh, uh, for Albany, and I'm not sure whether Andrew Cuomo and some, the other legislators are going to want to go along with that. Yeah, I think it's highly improbable. I mean, uh, the... Lotus says he can do it through savings. Bill. Same commitment, raise a half a billion dollars for preschool and after school. Waste, fraud, and abuse. <laughs> that, well, I mean, we, we, we always hear that, right? Uh, no, yeah. And yet we don't see that waste, fraud, and abuse eliminated. And uh, Bill de Blasio has made the point that, you know, mayors have gone there before and when they've made that real strong ask to raise taxes, that that ask has been honored by uh, Albany. But I, the, is the governor going to approve a tax hike in, a, in his re-election year? That, that seems highly impressive. Does it matter as long as, as it happens before he runs for re-election? He's running for re-election now. Right. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. you know, if you can point to it. Yes, sir. Uh, Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Mansoor, and I'm um, currently a senior at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And my question for you is, uh, you've addressed many issues. Uh, how do you feel the election will impact uh, us veterans? I'm per, um, a member of the armed forces as well. How do you think it'll affect us as far as benefits go? Well, I mean, the, uh, as I understand the veterans' benefits in New York City, they, are, um, they have to do with uh, point benefits on city jobs. They have to do with certain licenses that you can get that you know, veterans' issues, by and large, would be uh, would be more of a federal issue. There are mm -hmm. certain um, 
you know, you get an extra five points on a, on a city civil service test. I, I, I can't remember if it's five points, but there's certain benefits in that. I wouldn't anticipate those kinds of things um, changing. I do think that veterans are, in, in essence, I mean, you on, a, on a city level, or it's a rising tide lifts all boats that, um, you know, you're going to have to ride the tide whether it goes up or it goes down. I mean, yeah. I no, no, I, I would agree. I mean, there's also, there's also greater deference uh, uh, for, for uh, applications on the, the, for the, to the to NYPD, FDNY, right. and, and things, and things like that. I can't imagine those but, yeah, you No, know, no, no. Yeah. You know, you know they, they may, might even be possibly expanded, uh, especially given that, you know, both of, and given that both of those organizations are now under federal, uh, you know, federal oversight. And the yeah. fact that neither candidate is a veteran. I, I, I haven't heard um, Bill de Blasio speak about veterans' issues. I'm, I'm, I'm apologize if I'm doing him a disservice. But I did hear Joe Lota talk about veterans this week at City and States Conference about minority and women-owned businesses. And he was saying that he was hoping that veterans would be included in the designation of MWBEs right. and, and so that there would be, you know, some of the benchmarks for uh, would be including veterans uh, because so many veterans are minorities. Yeah. Oh, th thank you for your service, by the way. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Tiffany Ford, and I'm from York College. My question is for Ms. Gonzalez. When you said the voters have a different set of concerns than the political machines, what concerns specifically were you thinking of? Well, I mean, I think, I think we saw it played out with the stop and frisk issue. You know, that stop and frisk issue was one that was definitely resonated in ways that Mayor Bloomberg had no clue about, that none of the political organizations around the city touched in any way, shape, or form. Um, I mean, that, that to me is yet like the prime was, example. Yet it was visceral on the street. Absolutely. Yeah, and it was interesting. There were, uh, there were, there were two, I think, um, really major moments. And housing issues, too. Housing issues there, is the other one. There were two major, uh, I think, um, interesting moments in terms of the, uh, the candidates with, when it came, to, came, it came with Stop and Frisk. Um, there, was an early there was an early forum where, um, where B Billy Thompson and John Liu got into it. And John mm -hmm. Liu said, I'm the only one here who's going to completely get rid of, completely get rid of it. And Billy, T Billy Thompson then kind of responded in one of his uh, unusually kind of emotional ways. He, sa he says, look, um, uh, I'm concerned about stop and frisk, but also as, you know, the, as the father, uh, as a father of an African American, I'm also concerned about street safety as well. And I, and that's a, and that's a real balance. Mm -hmm. And that kind of push Lou, that push Lou back. And I think that kind of indirectly led to Thompson later on, you know, getting um, the, um, put the police support and so forth. But then that eventually then, of course, got trumped by the way um, de Blasio approached it with the ad and so forth. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good evening. My name is Shauna Bell, and I'm a senior at John Jay College. Um, earlier, you guys mentioned about um, voters not coming out in high numbers. Um, what do you think can be done in order to carry out more voters to the ballot, especially in um, low-income neighborhoods? Well, there's a lot of very interesting things going on. There are moves, is it in California where they're talking about allowing immigrants to vote? Um, you know, not you, you can't, non-citizen immigrants. You can't change that for federal elections because federal elections, but you can probably change that. We used to have very bizarre school board elections mm -hmm. and, right. um, and, and all parents, all immigrants, yes. California has instituted online voter registration. That has had a huge impact particularly in minority communities, which is interesting because you think about digital divides. Then, obviously, early, you know, uh, automatic registration in the schools, uh, at, at, you know, the whole motor voter thing, which was blocked by the Giuliani administration and never fully uh, implemented uh, by any of the other s uh, subsequent mayors. Uh, early voting, uh, because yeah. well, part of the problem you have in, in, in New York, you know, motor voter is not necessarily as effective as it might be in, in other states because, you know, we have, the, you know, the, the lowest, the, the, the fewest number of adults over 21 oh, um, who actually... No, no, but motor voter applies uh, okay. to every public agency. Uh, you were supposed to get voter registration forms at welfare offices. I mean, you could that do That was through something that style. Giuliani killed... Yeah. Uh, Schools. I mean, you should also have go to register students in schools. You, right. you should think about open primaries. Uh, the largest voting block is independent voters, mm -hmm. and essentially, if you're not a Democrat in New York City, you're largely disenfranchised, right? Mm -hmm. Because your vote has no consequence Except whatsoever. Except for the last five times. Mm -hmm. in, only no, in but, the but, it, but in terms of right? primaries, right. and so but only in the general. Uh, and yeah. so yeah, and you have open general. primaries. You could have nonpartisan elections. There are so many ways that you could spur uh, voter participation. Yeah, because well, I think there's I think no evidence of not non. 
partisan elections for his vote. Of, that's, that's pure ideology. There is no evidence on that point at all. Uh, but, but, the, but I think sort of, sort of to the larger point that I think that, that the question was trying to get us to talk about is that, one, it has to be easier for people to do it. And we've talked about right. a lot of different things that have been, you know, floated and just never passed. And second of all, people do have to feel like their vote matters. And there are a lot of people in the city that is like, well, why do I have to go vote since the race has already been decided? Because, you know, everybody's a, a Democrat from the same party and... I don't really care which one wins in the city council or in a bunch I mean, of other. A lot of it has to be there. There, there is a you know there is an enthusiasm enthusiasm gap which really has to be kind of addressed. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean we can always tinker at these things uh, on the on the margins in terms of of getting of of, uh, of making it easier to register and so forth. But people ultimately have to feel that they they need to they need to go there and cast their vote. I mean, Ken, what, but if I'm a Republican, I want to change my party to be a Democrat. I have to do so a year in advance, right? right? I mean, there we couldn't be anything more onerous to stop me from participating right. in the right. primary that I want to vote in. That's right. And what Robert's saying is exactly right. I mean, I think you, you talked about this as a heated Democratic primary, but really how heated? I mean, I, there were not a great deal of bona fide Quinn supporters and Thompson supporters out there. There was not someone who was energizing the electorate like we saw President Obama do, or, you know, we, mm -hmm. to a certain degree, Bill de Blasio <laughs> did catch fire in the end, but these were not candidates that were, you know, getting people I enthralled. And, well, the and ones so that, that did that seriously flawed. Yeah, the most energi energizing person out there for a while was, um, w um, was Anthony Weiner. And, and it is interesting, it is interesting if you if you actually see him campaigning i mean obviously he's got all of his issues and so forth but he's he is actually one of the few people out there who looks like he's having fun when mm -hmm. he's when yeah. he's going out there campaigning engaging you, you see him at any of the parades he's like uh, you know the one you know going out there carrying the biggest flag and, and just and, and, and going out to be and, and trying yeah. out a yeah. very Pre pretending. bizarre jamaican and i, and I would argue oh, that so uh, that anthony <laughs> Weiner did change this race because it, it really put it on the map uh, mm -hmm. Prior to that, no one was paying attention, and mm -hmm. he did energize a great deal of voters. And what happened was, after he imploded, those those voters were looking for an alternative, well, and, and they defected and he to he imploded, Bill de Blasio. He imploded at almost the exact same time at that um, Dante de Blasio. De Blasio. Uh, well, and de Blasio got arrested, and, and no, but everything. more than that, he imploded yeah, at a, just at the time that Dante de Blasio's ad okay. right. went on mm -hmm. the air. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it was a very fortuitous. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I do want to be Dante de Blasio's agent. That's one of the... Well, <laughs> I want yes, to know, you know, it's hair today, gone tomorrow. Uh. You're just jealous. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That is true. Hi, my name is Samantha Perez. I am a sophomore at CUNY Baruch. Um, my question is for all of you, as you were talking about... Um, about the about some of the suggestions that you would give to the um, to Bill De Blasio and Joe Loda, I would I wanted to know that um, after the primary, Chris Quinn and Bill Thompson have gracefully conceded to Bill to Bill De Blasio. Gracefully? Do you think that if elected, would Bill De Blasio offer Christine Quinn and and or perhaps only Bill Thompson a position in his administration? And if so, what kind of position well, would it be? Well, I, I think well, would they take it? Is right. I yeah. I mean, I think. It. Well, there's a rampant rumor that uh, Bill de Blasio cut a deal with Bill Thompson to offer him the chancellorship, which I think would absolutely be the Make most the calamitous support. move that he could make, right? Because it would ring up a, a brazen back backroom deal. Uh, but that is certainly out there uh, in the ether. Uh, I, I think that Bill, t Bill de Blasio would be very misguided to put either Christine Quinn or Bill I, I could put of the t of the two, it, it would be slightly more likely f for for him to uh, find something for Bill Thompson. Um, uh, Bill De Blasio and Chris Quinn have not liked each other for quite some time. They competed against each other for the speaker uh, for the speakership and obviously for the mayor. Uh, he wouldn't offer it to her, and she wouldn't accept it. We're running short of time. Yes. Uh, um, good evening. My uh, name is Ibrahim Diallo. I'm a senior at John Jay College. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, as an immigrant, and I wanted to ask you, uh, because we know that the mayor of New York City is uh, one of uh, the powerful mayors in uh, the United States. So what do you think they can uh, do for the legalization of undocumented uh, immigrants? It's a very interesting question, because obviously Mayor Bloomberg, with you know limited success in terms of actual action, but with tremendous success in focusing attention on the gun issue, um, you do have, uh, you know, we are, we have the highest, we're something like almost 40% of the population in this city now is 
foreign born and if you add up the foreign born and the children of foreign born we're, we're getting pretty close to half to half the population um, can be that voice and um, I mean what do you think about that well I, I do think that uh, participatory budgeting uh, which uh, enables um, people who are undocumented immigrants to vote and, and determine how some of the the money is is divvied up in their council districts for council members who participate in it is very positive uh, in getting in in bringing uh, civic engagement to undocumented immigrants. But, you, but, but I mean, right. we've seen the president completely stymied on this issue. I, I'm not sure yeah, but, that. But what's going on in Washington is not what's going on here. The the mayor of New York has a unique megaphone. So but, but be very know, quick. But look, yeah. I mean, just very quickly. I mean, this city has. I, I think sometimes we lose track of that. That. This city really is different from a lot of the rest of the country. Thank and, God for it. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. you know, every mayor that I can think of, certainly within my lifetime in New York, right. has been very pro-immigrant. And that, that just, I don't see right. that going. Let me, we only all. have about a minute left, so please. Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Jairo Guerra, and I am a junior at Lehman College. My question is for all of you after all these discussions. Uh, what, are going to be, what are going to be the challenges or obstacles the next mayor, either de Blasio or Loda, will face if either of them win on November Well, I think 5th. the biggest, I think that the biggest one is fiscal. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that, you know, you know, Richard Poole, you know, I had a ninth grade social studies teacher, Murray Kunkas at junior high school, 166 in East <laughs> New York, who said, rich or poor, it's good to have money. So, uh, uh, and I got remember a, it all got a years two or three billion dollar um, budget deficit um, facing them. That's even before they figure out all the contracts, and there are a lot of contracts. That are, um, that, that that are. And Carolina made a very interesting point, which is true, that Mayor Bloomberg used his personal fortune to fill holes which I don't believe de Blasio can do. Yeah, he, he, uh, ke he, kept, he kept a lot <laughs> of potential critics quiet, and those people are going to be itching to get their voices heard now, and they won't be bought off. Right. Does, um, we, have, we have 30 seconds left. I mean, do you see, is there anybody who thinks there's any way that Bill de Blasio does not win this election? If he sleeps. If he sleeps, so, I, I seriously, mean, like, but but he can't sleep on Loda. He really can't. I, I think he's actually been hiding from the press largely. I mean, if you look at his public schedule, he's been doing as few events as possible, and as he's up forty points in the poll, right, wouldn't no. you hide too? Mm -hmm. The only way he can lose is by making mistakes, and you're exactly right. The way not to make mistakes is to be invisible. Uh, um, Joe Loda has maybe a twenty to twenty-five percent um, ch chance of. Of winning, which means it's unlikely, but it's not. It can't be completely um, ruled out. I want to thank you all. It's uh, we're running out of time. I get the goodbye sign. I never miss deadline. And <laughs> uh, thank you all. We'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.